Hello everybody, I am uh, Rajdeep Chatterjee from the Department of Physics, IIT Roorkee and uh, I shall be talking on the special theory of relativity. Well, uh, the plan for the next uh, series of uh, lectures is something like this. Um, I shall talk on how relativity arose while um, reconciling the laws of uh, mechanics and electrodynamics. Well, to be more precise, uh, reconciling the transformation laws of mechanics and electrodynamics. Uh, in that context, I'll be talking of um, Galilean and Lorentz transformations, uh, moving over to the all important postulates of uh, special relativity. Okay, and um, uh, then I shall, of course, go over to the consequences, uh, which are uh, quite interesting. We'll be talking of. Uh, uh, length contraction, uh, time dilatation, mass energy equivalence. I mean, this is one thing perhaps uh, many of you are quite familiar with, E equal to mc square. Let's try to see, we'll, we'll try to see at, at a certain po uh, point of time how it all arose. Um, and uh, uh, in explaining all these things, uh, what I shall do is that uh, as and when necessary, uh, we'll talk of certain problems. We'll try to do some problems so as to illustrate uh, the uh, principles involved. Okay, okay. So let's start at the beginning. Mechanics. Um, uh, this F equal to m a. This perhaps is uh, the most famous equation in mechanics, if I may say so. Uh, you all know that if uh, the force of uh, uh, is applied on a particle of mass m it's going to accelerate with acceleration a. I mean, everybody knows this and this, if you, you can even tell me that this is actually Newton's second law of motion, okay? But what is assumed here, apart from, of course, in this particular case that uh, we, we, we treat m, that's the mass of a particle, that's, that's always constant, okay? Uh, well, if you have, well, you can argue that if you have a variable mass, you can talk of force as uh, rate of change of momentum. But let's stick to this form of uh, Newton's second law for the moment. Okay? Yeah, but what's important here is that uh, we always assume here that uh, somehow we have a frame of reference uh, where we are able to measure this acceleration. Okay? Now, frame of reference is actually a very fancy name for uh, for a simple coordinate system. I mean, coordinate system, you know, uh, simplest one, of course, is uh, the Cartesian coordinate system. I mean, if you see where uh, the walls of uh, of this room meet, I mean, the room in you are in, if it meets uh, with the floor, and then you see uh, the axis of the coordinate system. So, uh, we are quite familiar with the word uh, coordinate system. So, that is a fancy name, uh, the frame of reference, okay? Now, another thing is we sometimes hear of this word inertial frame. So, what's an inertial frame? Well, a very solid definition is an inertial frame is one in which Newton's laws of motion are valid. Okay? Now, Newton's laws of motion are valid in uh, inertial frames. So, but does this explain uh, where, uh, explain a person, explain and uh, uh, tell an engineer or a scientist where to look for this inertial frame? Um, we need to be a little bit more precise than this idealistic definition. And in doing that, in, in, in defining that, we can say that um, uh, it's a frame whose uh, coordinate axis are fixed uh, relative to the uh, uh, to the average position of a fixed star, fixed star in space, of course, or it's uh, that frame is moving with a uniform linear velocity. That's a constant velocity relative to the star. Of course, there should not be acceleration of the star; otherwise, uh, this definition is not valid. Uh, well, once I've said this, and uh, you realize that. Uh, any frame, uh, the earth itself, uh, the earth itself is revolving, I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, there is uh, day and night, there is this rotation due to which you have, uh, of course, day and night, and, and, and revolution around the sun, uh, that's the, uh, that gives the change of season. So, uh, there is some amount of acceleration here, so uh, basically any coordinate system attached to its surface is non-inertial. But 
for many purposes, uh, this acceleration is slight and then uh, by many purposes, I, I of course do not mean for all purposes, uh, if this acceleration can be considered slight. Here, uh, this particular frame, that is the frame on earth, uh, can be considered inertial. A little better would be a non-rotating frame with, uh, with an origin fixed at the earth center and axis uh, pointed towards the fixed star. So, that is uh, we can say it is approximately inertial. Well, even if you have this frame to be fixed at the center of the sun for example, it will be more inertial than compared to the frame I just described. Okay? But having said this, uh, we should be clear that uh, non-inertial frames are actually quite common in, uh, in mechanics. I mean, you must have heard of uh, Coriolis forces. Okay, so, these are non-inertial forces. Okay, so, uh, let us try to have a, a, a visual uh, explanation of what we have been trying to say in more uh, definitive terms. Okay. So, uh, here we have uh, frame S. Okay. So, uh, this is a three-dimensional Cartesian uh, system, a right-handed Cartesian system. Um, I have not uh, written the uh, z axis here, but you can all uh, guess and uh, you can all you can all uh, figure out that uh, z axis here actually points outside the screen. Okay? So, this is uh, frame S and then we have another frame S prime let us say and then uh, this frame S prime is moving uh, with a constant velocity or let us say an uniform velocity v uh, along the common x, x prime axis. Okay? Now, uh, the coordinates here are um, the uh, uh, x prime, y prime and z prime and here z prime again points outside the screen. Now, uh, at, at the beginning, at the very beginning, uh, you know, let us we have two observers who are let us say at the origins of both these frames and at the beginning both these frames coincide that is S and S prime, they have a common origin at the beginning at uh, time t equal to and t and t prime equal to 0. So, I will talk of this coordinates and time a little bit later. So, how to do that? I mean, uh, simple, I mean you start with uh, uh, two observers are there when they look at their watches and say that okay, fine, so our watches agree and this is the time we set as t equal to or t prime equal to 0 and then S prime frame starts moving with uniform velocity v with respect uh, along the common x, x prime axis. So, down the line uh, if we have a point p uh, which has um, coordinates x, y, z and then it is uh, measured at a certain time t, remember clock is moving. Uh, I mean time clock is working, clock is moving, I mean that time uh, is flowing. Uh, at a certain time t, so at that same instant, uh, let us say uh, observer in S prime measures the coordinate as x prime, y prime and z prime. Okay? So, uh, how are they related? Well, you can say that it is simple actually. So, how are they related? x prime is related by this relation x prime is equal to x minus v of t, v and t, uh, y is equal to y prime and z equal to z prime. Okay? And it is important that both these time coordinates agree. Okay? So, so that is we uh, this point is measured at the same uh, instant of time. Okay? So, they all started uh, with uh, synchronized watches. So, t prime equal to t here. Okay? Now, this transformation uh, we call uh, this transformation as Galilean transformation. Okay? Um, Let us delve a little bit further. Um, how are the uh, velocities, if you measure the velocities uh, in, uh, in both these frames, how are they related? Well, that actually will be given by the uh, Galilean velocity addition formula. Uh, so, uh, let us see uh, how it, 
how it can be derived. Uh, we have this uh, uh, we have this equation x prime equal to x minus v t. Uh, see that um, now you differentiate x prime with respect uh, to uh, the time in its own frame. So that is dx prime dt prime and uh, on the right hand side we are going to have dx by dt prime minus v dt dt prime. Okay? And now you realize that on the right hand side you have uh, a dx by dt prime. Now x is the coordinate in the s frame, but uh, t prime that is the time that is measured in the prime frame that is s prime frame. So, you need uh, so if you need velocities, so you need coordinates of the same frame. Okay? So, uh, coordinate and the time of course in the same frame I should say. So, uh, the third step clarifies how to do that. So, you have dx uh, dt and then you take uh, this uh, dt dt prime minus v of dt dt prime. Okay? Um, so, then you uh, realize that uh, dx prime dt prime that is the uh, u prime that is the veloci velocity that is being measured in the uh, primed frame. Okay? Now, you realize since t is equal to t prime in Galilean transformation. So, dt by dt prime that is equal to 1. So, uh, you realize uh, and then uh, dx uh, dt that is u and so dt by dt prime that is 1. So, minus v of minus v that is. So, you have uh, u prime is equal to u minus v. Now, uh, I mean uh, there is a subtraction sign here. So, uh, uh, do not be uh, to uh, bothered about that when I use the word addition formula because you can very well write uh, the uh, velocity which is in the s frame in terms of the s prime frame by saying that u is equal to u prime plus v. And what is v by the moment? Uh, by the way? So, it is uh, just the uh, velocity with which um, uh, the s prime frame is moving uh, uniform that is uniform velocity uh, with which the s prime frame is moving with respect to the s frame along the common x, x prime axis. Okay, so, that goes for uh, the uh, velocity uh, velocity addition formula. What about the acceleration? Mm -hmm. Well, we us start with what we, we have obtained for the uh, velocity. So, that is uh, u prime is equal to u minus v. So, uh, if you differentiate this once again, so uh, you are going to have du prime uh, uh, by dt prime is du dt. I mean how, of course, you know how to get this now. So, this is uh, du by dt, uh, you know how it will be. So, if you take uh, du by dt prime and then you have dt prime or dt by dt prime that is equal to 1. So, uh, the acceleration is going to be the same in uh, both frames. So, th these frames are moving uh, with uniform velocities with respect to one another. So, what we have is acceleration is being unaffected by uh, if you have frames which are moving with uh, uniform relative velocities. Okay? Now, on top of that if you consider that uh, uh, mass is unaffected by motion of reference frames. Uh, you come to an um, we come to a very interesting um, conclusion. We see that the form of Newton's second law is valid. Well, actually, Newton's second law is valid in both these frames, in both these inertial frames. Okay. So, so what does this mean? Well, this means that uh, by doing experiments entirely in one of these frames you cannot uh, distinguish it uh, from the other. Okay? So, if you are doing uh, experiments entirely in one of the frames, so and this frame is moving uh, with an uniform velocity v with respect uh, uh, to another frame, uh, you will uh, you cannot distinguish this particular frame from any other inertial frame. Okay? Uh, so, by, by mechanical experiments alone, that is what I am going to say here. Uh, 
so, so what you can ask so so what happens is that since newton's laws of motion are being valid are valid in uh, these two frames so are equations of motion okay uh, which are uh, derived from uh, from them and consequently the conservation laws so we're going to have uh, the conservation laws same in all these inertial frames okay so if you do your mechanics in one of one of these frames and you derive a conservation law you can be rest assured that in another inertial frame it's going to be the same it's going to be valid okay so uh, we could say that the laws of uh, mechanics are being invariant in uh, in all inertial frames okay so this is an uh, so this is an important conclusion um, so uh, next we move over to what uh, uh, is going to happen in electrodynamics okay so uh, what is electrodynamics so you see it's an interesting thing so uh, here uh, you have uh, what does it give you uh, it gives you that if you have a changing electric field you're going to have a magnetic field and then if you have a changing magnetic field you're going to have an electric field okay now we ask this question that is electrodynamics or the laws of electrodynamics invariant under Galilean transformation remember uh, laws of mechanics uh, they were invariant under Galilean transformation so we ask another branch of physics electrodynamics um, are the laws there invariant under Galilean transformation well uh, for that let's see what those laws are okay um, the basic laws they are the uh, encapsulated all in uh, Maxwell's equations um, well uh, divergence of e that 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 is equal to rho by epsilon 0 and e as you know is the electric field a rho is uh, the uh, uh, charge density and epsilon uh, epsilon 0 that's the permittivity of free space and then the curl of uh, e that's uh, minus del b del t b is the magnetic field and then uh, the divergence of b that is 0 the curl of uh, B that is mu 0 J, mu 0 that is the uh, permeability of free space and J that is the current density that uh, plus of course uh, mu 0 epsilon 0 del E del T. Now do not be bothered too much about this mathematical details. So what do they stand for? I mean uh, that is what I have written on the uh, right hand side of these equations. The uh, first one is actually Gauss's law. Uh, well, um, so it's a very important law. It actually allows you to calculate uh, the electric field if you have uh, symmetries in the in the problem, uh, uh, symmetric uh, the charge distribution that is. Okay. Uh, the second one, curl of E, uh, that's equal to minus del B del T. That's actually Faraday's law, and I'm sure you're aware of it because had this law not been there, I mean, you'd not have motors. Uh, you electric motors that is um, uh, you must have heard of uh, Faraday's important experiment in which you had this uh, he was moving a, uh, a magnet within a solenoid and then he detected uh, an EMF within the uh, leads of the solenoid okay um, then the third uh, thing I mean the third equation that I have written here I mean, should not be talked as a third law that is divergence of B equal to 0 uh, which, uh, which well does not have a law, it does not have a name as such but uh, its physical implication is that there are no magnetic monopoles so like that. Like you have a, uh, you have a positive and negative charges, you do not have uh, charges in uh, uh, magnetic uh, poles in isolation, okay? you do not have magnetic monopoles. Uh, the uh, curl of B that is um, mu 0 J plus um, uh, mu 0 epsilon 0 del E del T. Well, that's actually a curl of uh, B is equal to mu zero J. That's actually Ampere's law, okay? And then uh, added to that is Maxwell's correction. Well, uh, that Maxwell, uh, well, Maxwell's corrections are actually quite uh, important. We're going to see later on because uh, it had rather quite, uh, rather very uh, um, interesting implications uh, in showing that uh, these. Uh, the Maxwell's uh, equations. Well, by the way, so what you see here is uh, all uh, E and B are coupled. These are coupled partial differential equations. 
So, uh, well, uh, these corrections were important uh, because he was able to show that, uh, well, he, he put, he uh, uh, introduced this concept of uh, displacement current and then uh, was able to show that these equations uh, when written in terms of uh, only E or only B could be framed in terms of uh, the wave equation. More of that a little later. Okay. Okay. So, are Maxwell's equations invariant under Galilean transformations? Under uh, the transformations, mechanics is invariant on. So, what were these transformations once again? So, so you have an S prime frame moving with uh, an uniform velocity v along the common x x prime axis. Okay. Now again, uh, z and z prime, uh, this axis are, are moving, uh, are actually out of the screen, okay, they are pointing out outside the screen. And this transformations x prime is equal to x minus v t, y prime is equal to y, z prime is equal to z and t prime is equal to t. So, are Maxwell's equation invariant under this? Well, the answer is no, okay. They are invariant under uh, a different transformation. Maxwell's equation are, no, uh, are not invariant under Galilean transformation, but Maxwell's equations are invariant under Lorentz transformation. Okay, so what is that? So again, we have uh, the frames S prime uh, moving the uniform relative velocity v along the common x x prime axis, but here uh, we need uh, x prime to be given by not only x minus vt uh, divided by root over of 1 minus v square by c square. Okay. And of course, uh, here uh, y prime is equal to y, z prime is equal to z. Remember, uh, we are moving uh, along common x, x prime axis. What is interesting here is that see that the times are not matching. In uh, Galilean transformation, we had t is equal to t prime, but here t prime is equal to t minus v x by c square divided by root over of 1 minus v square by c square. Okay. So, uh, th uh, this v is actually the velocity with which uh, the frame s prime is moving with respect to uh, the s frame. Okay. Uh, what is this uh, c here? Well, you have guessed that is the uh, speed of light, but uh, all of a sudden how come this speed of light is there? So, remember this is the uh, transformation under which uh, Maxwell's equations are invariant. Okay? So, do we see, uh, do we see c, that is the velocity of light or uh, I am sorry, the speed of light in vacuum. Uh, explicitly in Maxwell's equation, I mean on the left hand side I have written that once again just for your convenience. Uh, well, it is not present explicitly, uh, uh, so uh, we ask this question, so where is this coming from? Okay. So, is C ingrained somewhere within Maxwell's equation itself? Okay. Now, for that what you have to do, as I said, is that uh, Maxwell's equation, these are uh, 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 coupled uh, partial differential equations. Now, if you uncouple them, okay, you have, uh, there is a price to pay. You see that uh, you have a second order equation then. Okay, so, you have uh, del square E is equal to uh, mu 0 epsilon 0 del 2 del T square of E and similarly for the magnetic field also you have uh, the Laplacian, I should say the, the del square B or the, the Laplacian of B that is uh, mu 0 epsilon 0 is del 2 V del T square. Okay. Now, this has an uncanny resemblance with uh, the wave equation, you know waves, water waves, sound waves, uh, this kind of waves. So, it is wave equation here. So, uh, the Laplacian of F that is equal to 1 by V square of uh, del 2 f uh, del t square. Okay, so, t is the time here and what is v? v is the uh, velocity of the wave. Uh, 
now you see uh, in these two sets of equation, if you uh, compare uh, Maxwell's equation of uh, B and E with the wave equation, what you are going to see is that uh, this term mu 0 epsilon 0 can be compared with 1 by V square. Okay? So, which means that uh, if it, if it, I mean, since it resembles the wave equation, uh, mu 0 epsilon 0 somehow has some sort of relation with velocity. Okay? It actually, uh, you are going to see that 1 by mu 0 epsilon 0 is, uh, d does indeed turn out uh, to be, uh, and 1 by root over of mu 0 epsilon 0 does indeed have um, uh, the uh, dimension of velocity. It is actually 3 to 10 to the power 8 meter per second. Okay, so more on that value later on when you put in uh, their values. Okay. But uh, also from uh, physical principles in hindsight, you can also uh, check that uh, mu 0 epsilon 0 should have uh, the uh, dimensions of 1 by velocity squared. Well, how to do that? Well, well, check any one of uh, check any one of uh, Maxwell's equations in E or B. Check the first one. The Laplacian of E is equal to mu zero epsilon zero del to E del t square. Now, this Laplacian of E, Laplacian, how does it look like? Del to del x square plus del to del y square plus del to del z square. That kind of a thing. So it has a dimension one by length squared okay so on the left hand side i mean for the moment look at these operators that's that, that's more important now because e and e uh, so uh, the e and e they have the same dimension so what we need to do is to balance the dimensions of rest of uh, the operators and rest of the things here but on the right hand side we will be concerned with mu 0 epsilon 0 del 2 del t squared okay now you have a t squared in the denominator here so, which means that that is time squared. Okay. So, on the left hand squared you have on the left hand side you have 1 by length squared uh, and then on the right hand side you have 1 by time squared. Okay. So, what should be then the dimension of mu 0 epsilon 0 so that you have this entire thing mu 0 epsilon 0 del 2 del t square to have the dimension of length square. Okay. Well, it has to have then the dimension of 1 by velocity square. Okay? So, then in hindsight we can actually, we actually can figure out that mu 0 epsilon 0 should have the dimension of 1 by velocity square. Well, similarly that is the same thing, the same conclusion you re, uh, realize from uh, the uh, second equation uh, Laplacian of B is uh, mu 0 epsilon 0 del to B del t square. Okay. Now, on this value 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second, okay. and you might have already guessed that this number is actually the speed of light. Okay. So, you see speed of light is actually ingrained within Maxwell's equation itself and then del 2 uh, Laplacian of E is actually equal to the Laplacian of the electric field and the Laplacian of the magnetic field. You see that it is 1 by c square and then here on top you have del 2 e del t square and for the magnetic field del 2 b del t square. Okay? Now, since it follows the pattern, since it follows the form of the wave equation. Okay? So, Maxwell concluded that then light must be an electromagnetic wave. Okay? Now, this had a profound significance because light electromagnetic wave and you see that I have written wave in um, in, uh, in italics um, because in those days well in, in the 19th century actually people thought that uh, waves actually uh, require a, a material medium to propagate well, why was that they, uh, they uh, the reason that okay, you have water waves which require wa water to propagate. You have sound waves, you need media, I mean, you need air, or even sound waves can travel through uh, another material, for example, through a metal. 
but in any case you need a medium to propagate. So, uh, so the reason that perhaps they also light also should require a medium to propagate. So, and then uh, they just name this uh, medium as ether or actually they used to call it the luminiferous ether. Okay. And the further reason that um, as light can travel through vacuum, then vacuum must contain uh, this medium of light uh, which is ether. So, vacuum is full of ether okay that is the medium of light okay. Now, like every assertion in physics and if you even if you make a theory it has to be proved it has to be validated by experiments and so that is the challenge uh, that uh, confronted physicists at uh, in those days uh, in the late 19th century is to uh, detect ether and its uh, properties okay. So, uh, they were thinking of a possible experiment in which to measure the uh, speed of light in uh, different inertial frames okay? and, and to see if uh, the speeds were different in, in, the, in these uh, different systems. Okay? Now, in case they were different, uh, they are going to look for evidence of a special frame where uh, that is the ether frame and that is going to be a preferential frame where the uh, speed of light is C itself that is C 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second that is the speed of light in vacuum. Okay. So, they were, they were looking for an ether frame and uh, this experiment remember was to be done on earth. So, sitting on earth they were supposed to detect ether. Now, consider the fact that earth is in motion. Okay. So, uh, if an experiment is being done on earth and then earth is in motion, so you should be able to detect an ether wind in a sense quote unquote an ether wind okay? and then the magnitude and direction of ether of this ether wind uh, would vary with uh, season and of course, the time of the day because of uh, rotation of the earth. Okay? So, the point was. Uh, so, the suggested experiment was to uh, measure uh, the uh, return speed of light, okay? so going and coming back. Okay? Uh, since ether was always there in an ether frame in, uh, in different seasons and in uh, various times of, of the day. Okay? Um, why? Because if uh, earth is moving relative to the ether frame, uh, the uh, return speed of light would be different and this difference could be detected then and that would be a test for uh, the presence of ether. But remember, uh, devising such an uh, experiment was uh, indeed very difficult. Okay. So, uh, but, uh, but there were smart people, there were, uh, there, was, um, there were Michelson and Morley who in the later part of uh, 19th century uh, they uh, devised an uh, interesting instrument, uh, they devised actually they devised an interferometer uh, which goes by uh, their name now. So, uh, that had a, a light source, okay. so light uh, is emitted from the source, it comes and hits um, the semi silvered mirror that is actually a beam splitter. Okay. So, then you have mirrors uh, on two sides perpendicular and parallel to this um, light source and then a detector on the other side uh, light gets uh, shown here. So, what happens is that uh, light uh, comes and hits this semi silvered mirror, okay, it splits into two parts, okay, goes through the mirrors, is reflected back. Okay. So, there you see the signs a little bit different symbols for uh, this reflected rays and for this reflected ray then recombines uh, and goes to the detector and uh, there will be uh, constructive, contra constructive and uh, destructive interferences uh, due to which there will be a fringe pattern at this detector. Okay? Now, remember this experiment is being done on earth. Okay? Now, uh, as earth is moving in the ether frame okay, and uh, so, if this flow of ether is uh, 
parallel to uh, one of the uh, uh, one of these uh, beam directions let's say parallel to the uh, going from uh, if the direction of ether is from uh, light source towards uh, the uh, mirror on your right hand side and um, then uh, what will happen is that uh, the return speed of light will be uh, different from uh, the uh, return speed on the perpendicular to the ether flow. Why? Because uh, if it's parallel to the uh, flow of ether, uh, then uh, once it goes parallel, it's towards uh, it's flowing with uh, you know in the direction of ether. But when it's being reflected black, it's opposite to the flow of ether. Okay, so there there's going to be a difference in time uh, of uh, the uh, return speed of uh, uh, of the return of light in in both this axis and. Um, what you're going to have is that this difference is going to cause a shift in the fringe pattern at the uh, detector. Okay, so uh, the expected result was that uh, there would be a, a fringe shift at the detector, uh, which would confirm uh, the presence of ether. Okay, but surprise, surprise! The uh, actual result was that although this was done. I mean, different season, different times of the day, no discernible fringe shift was observed. I mean, you could have argued that maybe a more sophisticated instrument or uh, later on uh, they could have uh, rechecked that. It was checked even by other people and also uh, by, uh, by more sophisticated equipments and there was no evidence of this uh, ether frame. Well, but jokingly of course, sometimes people call uh, this is the most famous um, failed experiment. Okay, so there was no ether. Now, towards uh, the end of uh, the 19th century, on the other hand, uh, Albert Einstein was also very concerned, I mean, he was also uh, concerned on a different thing. He was concerned that uh, the uh, laws of classical mechanics and um, electrodynamics were not following the same transformation laws. They were following uh, Galilean and the Rollins transformation laws. Okay, so this was quite troublesome to him. You know, he uh, being a theoretician. Um, so he reasoned that: Does it mean that uh, an inertial system, uh, which is actually indistinguishable by mechanical experiments? Remember, uh, we saw earlier that um, uh, with the help of uh, uh, mechanical uh, experiments, you are not able to uh, distinguish between uh, inertial uh, systems, uh, different inertial systems because Newton's law is going to be valid in each one of them in the same form. Okay. So, does it mean that, okay, I mean with mechanical experiments, it is not being possible, but by other uh, means, by, by, by other electromagnetic means, or maybe optical methods, can you then uh, distinguish between inertial systems? That to Einstein was a very worrisome thing because here you have then uh, different uh, branches of physics following different uh, uh, transformation laws. Okay. Now, he reasoned that uh, this need not be so. This that there is uh, there is somehow there is a uh, there is a problem somewhere. So, uh, he uh, figured out that uh, actually it is the uh, Lorentz transformations which were more general than uh, the Galilean transformations. I will put the words uh, more general in italics here. So, that means that I will explain that a little bit more later on. And uh, he um, talked of uh, the need to modify mechanics, the laws of mechanics accordingly, so that uh, electrodynamics and mechanics follow the same uh, transformation laws. Okay. Now, to uh, do this, Einstein had to make uh, two important um, assumptions. Okay. Uh, they are actually the uh, postulates of special relativity. Okay. So, uh, the first postulate that is the uh, principle of relativity, so which uh, tells us that the laws of physics are going to be the same in all inertial frames. 
okay so there's go there, there should not be any preferred inertial frame okay there's there is no preferred inertial uh, no preferred inertial frame axis okay and then uh, the second postulate uh, which says uh, which talks of uh, the uh, constancy of the speed of light uh, the second assumption postulate and the speed of light uh, in free space it has the uh, same value c in all inertial frames okay now with these two postulates uh, einstein started uh, his uh, calculations and uh, let's go let's check a little bit more on uh, let's let's take this idea a little bit more on the uh, uh, second uh, uh, postulate uh, so here we have uh, the two frames s and s prime moving with uh, uh, velocities uh, moving with a velocity v uh, with respect uh, the s prime frame is moving with a velocity v uh, along the common x x prime axis uh, then uh, and then of course at t equal to t prime they started so they, they, they coincide and uh, we consider a ray of light starting from a common origin and reaching point p okay and then let's uh, measure uh, the uh, distance op and o prime p in both these frames so what would uh, an observer in s frame measure op as and what an observer in s prime frame uh, measure o prime p as okay so the distance wise that would be uh, op that would be x square plus y square plus z square so that's equal to c square t square remember c is the uh, speed of light and then o prime p uh, that is x x prime squared plus y prime square plus z prime square that's equal to uh, c square t prime square now notice of course so according to the second uh, postulate we have uh, taken the speed of light uh, to be the same in uh, both these frames okay now uh, you are assured that uh, x square plus y square plus z square now you you subtract out uh, c square t square okay it's going to give you zero and a similar thing is going to happen if you subtract out c square and t prime square from uh, the uh, primed uh, uh, from x prime square plus y prime square plus z prime square that's going that that is, that too is going to give you zero so now the same thing is going to happen if you go to another frame moving with certain other velocity v prime let's say or v double prime let's say okay so the distance there could be x double prime square plus y double prime square plus z double prime square and if the observer there has measured uh, time t prime minus c square t prime square remember that uh, this uh, speed of light is taken the same in all inertial frames here but we point out that the quantity x square plus y square plus z square minus c square t square is an invariant quantity okay so that's the thing that's not changing now for this invariant quantity so which of these transformations galilean or lorentz preserves this uh, invariance okay the answer is and you can actually check this out you can put uh, x prime is equal to x minus uh, vt x prime is uh, y prime is equal to y z prime is equal to z t prime is equal to t and check if this invariance is uh, uh, preserved uh, you, you're going to see that it's not so it's only the lorentz transformation which is going to preserve this uh, invariance okay now let's uh, see what that is so uh, well we have we have been introduced to lorentz transformation before uh, while well, i've been talking about the laws of electrodynamics so but let's write it down once again so that's uh, x prime is equal to x minus vt uh, by root over of 1 minus v square by c square y prime is equal to y uh, z prime is equal to z and t prime is equal to t minus v x by c square root over 1 minus v square by c square of course i mean if this looks a little bit uh, more complicated um, uh, sometimes people actually write it in a more compact form 
by taking um, this ratio v by c as beta and then writing gamma as 1 minus uh, by, by 1 by root over of 1 minus v square by c square which is the same as 1 by root over of 1 minus beta square. So, uh, Lorentz transformations uh, can be very uh, concisely written in terms of uh, in this fashion written in this uh, white box x prime is equal to gamma times uh, x minus beta c t ok. So, why beta c because you see beta is equal to v by c ok and here uh, we had x minus v t. So, we had to write uh, beta c here ok. So, the y's and z's are the same here, but uh, it is very interesting to write the time coordinates. So, if you multiply that by c, so it has uh, the dimension of uh, length again. So, c t prime is equal to gamma of c t minus beta x. Have you noticed one thing? It is that um, if you notice uh, the thing for this x prime, the transformation equation for the x prime and the c t prime. Okay? See that x prime and the last you have beta times c t. Okay? But when you have c t prime, you have in the last you have beta times x. Okay? And then so you see it it's it looks very symmetrical so when you have the uh, when you have the uh, length coordinate you have the time coordinate and when you have the time coordinate you have the length coordinate now this is something new this is something new to us this is something which is not natural to us i mean we are quite used to galilean transformation in our real life okay but here what you see is that in this um, time coordinate you have some uh, you have you have uh, the length coordinate as well okay so naturally this is going to have consequences and we're going to check all these things in subsequent lectures okay just uh, one more thing uh, we, we 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 were actually talking of all we were actually always talking of what's the quantity in the s prime frame uh, in terms of quantities in the s frame so, we can also talk of uh, the opposite things. So, uh, what is the, uh, I mean, how can you say what, what are the quantities in S frame in terms of quantities in S prime frame? For that, it is very easy to, cons I mean, it is it's, uh, it's the same situation if you consider uh, S, S frame to be moving with a velocity minus v with respect to the S prime frame. In that case, you can simply write down x is equal to gamma times x prime plus beta c t prime. Of course, y and y prime are the same, z and z prime are the same. And then c t is equal to gamma times c t prime plus beta x prime. Now, what I have done here, as I said, was to express uh, the quantities in, uh, in, uh, in S frame. So, we want to understand uh, calculate quantities in uh, x frame uh, in, in the s frame in terms of quantities in the primed frame okay so like we can take a break here and in the uh, next talk we're going to focus on uh, again on the postulates of relativity and then uh, the consequences of uh, the lorentz transformations where we're going to carry our discussions um, a little more okay so to summarize what we have been uh, doing today uh, we have been uh, looking at uh, the uh, laws of uh, mechanics and electrodynamics and we saw that uh, actually um, they were not the transformation laws of uh, mechanics and electrodynamics were not the same they were the galilean and lorentz uh, because Einstein was so concerned and then uh, he, uh, he, uh, he showed that uh, if you take, uh, if he, he, he took, um, he actually showed that uh, the Lorentz transformations were actually the more uh, general transformation laws. And uh, if you take that, uh, you are going to, you need to change mechanics. Okay? So, these are certain things uh, that we will be considering in our uh, future talks. Okay. Thank you.